In fact, I see more possibilities in adversity than in, say, lying on satin pillows. So in that respect, I, I guess I am an optimist. I think there's reason for optimism. I think there's reason for, at least for personal optimism. I don't know if, if the world is going to survive, but I'm going to go as long as my heart beats. Well, your book should have political consequences, although you know where demand reform. Uh, this book should surely be a bestseller in New York City at least, telling us what most of us really had no idea about is what the life of a homeless person is like. Uh, nowhere do you mourn the existence of the homeless, uh, but anybody reading the book is, is bound to say, my God, something's got to be done about this. Um, yeah, um, and the Wall areas, you know, that's a tough one. Uh, um, it, it decide, you know, <laughs> I've never seen, you know, man tries to be a sociologist all the time, but the truth is, you know, if you look around, we really suck at it. <laughs> so I don't know if, if, if there's, I don't know if there's anything, I mean, to be done about what? Um, uh, eliminating it, moving these people, getting them out of our face. Uh, feeding everybody. Um, I don't know what's to be done about it except to find what your relationship is to it. I think that's the only work. I don't think the work is to eliminate what offends our sense of what should be or uh, who we are. I think the work is to find a way to a relationship to it. Just uh, when you pass somebody on the street, what is your relationship with them? I mean, how are you a human being to them? I mean, and beyond that, I think uh, anything beyond that is bullshit. We, you, you used to sell street news, and you started writing for street news, and then I guess you b became mm -hmm. uh, probably their top writer. Were you editor in chief finally? I was editor in chief when they they decided they would, couldn't pay any more salaries, and everybody else left. Yeah, but you got to <laughs> sleep on the couch I, in the I got office. To sleep on the couch in the office, which yeah. was a, which was a good deal. But I, I confess, deal. I haven't read street news the way I should have. Were there editorials in there about what should be done about the homeless? There were some. There were, there were, there were often some. And, um, and there, there was never any accord because, you know, it's like trying to, to push a waterbed flat. You know, you push it here and it pops up over there. And I found, you know, there, I have a prior history of sociology and, and be raising, coming up black in, in the 60s. And um, here it's 60 years later, uh, and billions of dollars, and lots of speeches, and countless laws, and uh, all I'm hearing these days is, whoops, we made a mistake. You know, so I, you know, I really don't have a lot of faith in, in um, installing uh, a perfect society, or even uh, a pro forma solution to any kind of social problems. Very, very much so. I, uh, but I admit, when I was in those days, I wrote a couple of uh, begrudging, you know, I wish so and so would get off of his that, uh, his this, and I wish people would do that type editorials. But for me, the fun stuff was uh, that uh, when I could just riff on my own, just go on about what's inside of my head. That was an amazing thing to be on the streets and not be heard, you know, as a, as. Joe Homeless would just be able to have a place where I can just riff from my own mind. That's a very amazing, remarkable, and uh, wonderful place to be in the middle of the 1990s, or in the 80s. It was a wonderful place to be. It was, I would have, I was rich in that respect. Yeah. The average person who had a home didn't have that. So it was, it was, a, it was a wonderful forum for me. Editorials are, Editorials, I always find, are just the agenda that's attached to events. And, it's, and uh, I got very tired of writing them. I, I don't suppose I wrote many of them all that well. But the stuff, the stuff I like was writing about people, places, and things, and first-person stuff. But I sure love that couch. <laughs> so. do, you, do you run into old friends who are still on the street? 
Um, yeah, I do. I do. And uh, do you, is your impulse to rescue him or to do something for him? Not at all. Well, you're not a very nice guy. No. <laughs> no. Actually, I'm not very presumptuous either. Um, you know, I barely rescued myself. And, um, and uh, you know, one thing I noticed from being on, being on the street is that, you know, looking the other way is that all of us are really, everybody in this room is really just sort of groping their way around in life. We, we, we grab one of the things that tell us we got it all figured out, but I bet if I asked to show our hands of how many people just had a little bit of doubt that they don't have it all figured out, I bet you everybody would raise their hand. So in, in, in that respect, it's kind of presumptuous to, uh, I think, to try to, try to know how you can save the next person. Uh, at least for me, this may surprise a lot of people for, uh, to hear me say, but it, it's, it's an honest answer. I don't really, I'm still working on, you know, saving myself is going to be a, a lifetime job. So I don't know if I can really get to the point where I have time or the, the wherewithal to, to save you, the next guy. I don't know what's right for you. I wouldn't presume to tell you right now. Well, you gave us a wonderful gift in the process of, <laughs> thank you. of building your soul, I must say. Thank you. It's really a swell book. And I, I, I compared him to Jack London because are, are you going to read the part where he realizes he can write? Uh, no, we don't have that part. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell the story, Lee. Where were you when, when you discovered you really could write? You well, <laughs> That story's been, Mike, really, I really wish I could wiggle out of that one because that, that's been hammered into the ground. Um, uh, but I was, I was uh, just sitting there with a pencil, I'll say that much, and um, a pencil that I was using to, as a drug implement to, to, to push the screens in my pipe. And uh, one day I didn't have any drugs and I decided to use it as a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of smart that way. <laughs> <laughs> because I was going to use that pencil some way or another that day. And, uh, and I started writing. And the remarkable thing was it, it was five hours later before I stopped. That was really remarkable. I don't think I did anything for five hours in a row during that time except uh, try to get high and then try to outrun and then, or try to outrun the effects of getting high. I don't think there was anything else I did with that much concentration. It was a remarkable moment. Well, I, I identified him with Jack London because Jack London <coughs> had the same sort of experience. He had hit bottom and he was working in a steam laundry. And he decided, God, there's something better than this. And he started writing and it turned out he could really do it. And, uh, Ask us a question. <laughs> well, I think this is a good place to um, read a little bit from each of the books. The first is a passage from Grand Central Winter. It's one of those bright, glorious Indian summer days, gold dust streaming through the front windows of the Street News editorial office, treetops across Ninth Avenue swaying gently in the breeze. And I'm standing hunched over my desk, teeth clenched, cursing, muttering at the printer, one of those worthless low-end Panasonic dot matrix jobs with a temperament all its own, sitting in frozen silence, red error light blinking dumbly back at me, refusing to print so much as a digit. And what keeps running through my mind is, why am I doing this? But I know why. I did it to myself. I went and got myself an honest job. Not that I was looking, I had an income. I sold papers, as many and for as long as my needs required. I didn't really feel I was missing anything out of life by being on the street either, at least not anything that could be had by paycheck. And I wasn't really interested in being employed simply for the sake of it. What I wanted was to do something worth a bit of satisfaction as well as a buck, something that might make a difference. I imagined that as a writer, I might help light up Street News' pages and that this might help it emerge from its doldrums. 
I was wrong. Of course. Not that I'm complaining exactly. I enjoy working with words. That part of the job delivers a certain satisfaction. But as for any of my work making a real difference in the larger scheme of things, as for having had any impact on the growing public resentment toward homeless people, I've had to climb down from that high horse. From Timequake. I have taught creative writing during my 73 years on automatic pilot, rerun or not. I did it first at the University of Iowa in 1965. After that came Harvard and then the City College of New York. I don't do it anymore. I taught how to be sociable with ink on paper. I told my students that when they were writing, they should be good dates on blind dates, should show strangers good times. Alternatively, they should run really nice whorehouses, come one, come all. <laughs> Although they were, in fact, working in perfect solitude. I said I expected them to do this with nothing but idiosyncratic arrangements in horizontal lines of 26 phonetic signals, 10 numbers, and maybe eight punctuation marks because it wasn't anything that hadn't been done before. In 1996, with movies and TV doing such good jobs of holding the attention of literates and illiterates alike, I have to question the value of my very strange, when you think about it, charm school. There is this. Attempted seductions with nothing but words on paper are so cheap for would-be ink-stained Don Juans of Cleopatra's. They don't have to get a bankable actor or actress to commit to the project, and then a bankable director and so on, and then raise millions and millions of buccarinis from manic depressive experts on what most people want. Still in all, why bother? Well, here's my answer. And many people need desperately to receive this message. I feel and think much as you do, care about many of the things you care about, although most people don't care about them. You are not alone. <laughs> so that leads to the question of why do we do what we do, whether writing or anything else? Well, um, since you billed me as the new Jack at London, I'll have to say it beats working in a laundry. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, it's a, it's a, for me, it, the reason I do it is um, it's the first thing I completely chose to do on my own. I tried on my own, made up myself, and, and kind of uh, found that I could do all right at it. That's, that's, that's almost 90% of it. And also, I guess there's 10% of the fact of that it, it um, that it's, I find it's very good for me. So then that, that leaves maybe a half a percent where I hope it will be good for you guys. Uh, I don't mean to be stingy, but, but um, I found that when I try and do it the other way, that I overdo it. And then it's good for no one. Well, there's a swell book that's out of print now. Maybe seven stories will bring it out again. It's called uh, uh, The Writer and Psychoanalysis by a man who's now dead named Edmund Burglar. And uh, he said he claimed he had treated more, more writers than, and he was practicing in New York, of course, he had treated more writers than, than anybody else in his field. And he said that writers were fortunate in order that they were able treat their neuroses every day by writing. And he said as soon as a writer was blocked, this was catastrophic because the writer would start to, to go to pieces. And so I, I said in a piece for Harper's, or a letter I wrote to Harper's about the death of the novel, uh, that people would continue to write novels or maybe short stories because they would discover that they are treating their own neuroses. And I have <coughs> said about practice of the arts that practicing any art is painting, music, dance, whatever, literature, is not a way to make a money or to become famous. It's a way to make your soul grow. So you should do it anyway. And uh, mm. And uh, what Bill Gates is saying now, and 
How much were they offering to kill Tom and Rusty? Uh, the million dollars. I'll, I'll pay anybody here a million dollars who kill Bill Gates. <laughs> but let's see the money. He, he's he's saying, you know, hey, don't worry about making your soul grow. There's also a new program. Is they let your computer grow year after year after year, mm -hmm. and cheating people out of the experience of becoming. You know, I, I saw a book being written, uh, written about in one of the papers today, and, and the book was about how to what, hold on to power or be powerful. And, and uh, at the face of it, you know, it seems like, you know, a, a go, go, go 90s book. When you think about it, some of the advice he was, he was giving people in the book was like totally anti-human. It was like, make people depend on you, you know. <laughs> this is, people buy books to learn how to do this. Uh, it said um, one of his things was, uh, "Don't say much; people will think you're smart." You know. <laughs> so I wondered why you wrote the book. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so when you when you're shooting uh, Bill Gates, uh, if your bullet misses, I hope it hits this guy. <laughs> Uh, we have another passage, this one from Grand Central Winter. Uh, afterwards, we'll ask another question. This describes uh, an encounter at the Central Booking Holding Cell. Early that evening, the cell gates clanged open, and the CO ushered in a thin, bare-chested Spanish kid wearing hospital green pajama bottoms splattered with crimson. His arms were swathed rich, wrist to elbow in bandages, and he was grinning ear to ear. I had to keep my shirt for evidence, he announced to no one in particular, holding his damaged arms aloft like trophies. And then, without prompting, he launched with relish into his war story. He and his crew were doing a burglary. Cops surprised them in the middle of it. He, he took a bullet in one arm, trying to escape. This was a matter of particular pride. And he'd done in the other arm, scrambling over razor wire. So they had to patch him up at Bellevue before they could book him. All in all, it was a Hollywood-worthy night out for a restless teen. They tell me I'm a career criminal, he gushed. Incorrigible! <laughs> Everyone was duly impressed. I was both captivated and unsettled by his moxie, though I never let on. I was puffing on a cigarette, contemplating how much of it to leave for the guy who had begged the short from me, when I saw the kid move for the Jersey boy. I like that rope, homeboy, he said, leaning his face into Jersey's. Let me get that chain. Something in his hand was, was pressing against Jersey's jugular. Incorrigible. But this was just the thing to break the monotony of sitting on your butt awaiting the pleasure of the court. The holding cell sprang to life. A circle of inmates formed too deep around Jersey and the kid. If we were going to be treated to a throwdown, they were determined to keep the COs at bay for as long as possible. But Jersey had had enough fisticuffs for one night, apparently. He didn't give up the chain, but he did yell for help. I heard keys rattle in the gate. A second later, correction officers were elbowing their way through the human blockade. But the kid, who could have easily just ditched the shiv, remained oblivious to them. He just stood there menacing Jersey while the guards broke through and grabbed him. And as they hauled him off to book him on an additional charge, I caught a glimpse of his face, his smirk, was wider than ever. Most of us in the cell could expect to walk. We knew if we just bided our time and let the criminal justice grind take its course, we could get back to whatever it was we were doing with a minimum of hassle. The kid, though, knew he wasn't going anywhere. He was a career criminal. He also knew that with his good looks, youth, and diminutive size, it was better to go inside with a don't give a fuck badass rap preceding him. In that respect, he was, for all of his bravado, only being practical and buying in on the cheap for all that. When it comes to justice, the kind that gets you locked up is different from the kind you find inside. Personally, I would like to see all the judges and district attorneys made to do time. Not for the crimes they commit from the bench, for they commit those out of ignorance, which is precisely why time in prison should be part of their qualifications. So that they might come to know what they don't know they don't know. Let them sit faceless and despised in the holding cells. Let them be run through the ringer of their process 
until the wind has been wrung out of their self-righteousness and let them stumble on the wisdom every two-bit con knows instinctively that real justice is always poetic. So the question... The question is, there is the adventure of life and there is our need to understand it. What might be the relationship between those two events for each of you? Wow. Well, I, I'm still kind of flummoxed here as you write better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. Big, the, big, the big questions like that make me nervous because, you know, I, you know, it took a, quite a while to, to write this book, and it's all packaged, and it's out there, and, you know, so I don't want to say anything that is going to fuck it up, you know. <laughs> right now, I peep, I've got everybody's confidence from the book, but um, there was, for me, there was a very, very, very big relationship between uh, the, what did you call it, the adventure? Adventure and the events. The, the, the adventure, and it, it was, and I did look at, at the, the, the time on the street as an adventure. I looked at it that way from the very first day. I said, well, let's see what happens next. And um, there's a very big relationship to it because when I finally came up for air, actually I had made a big mistake out there. I don't think the mistake was the streets. I think it was getting myself trapped all over again. It wasn't any particular thing. But at the time I got myself trapped, it was trapped into a certain cycle. And uh, by the time, I think, it, it, once I got off the streets, I didn't know what else to do with myself. I certainly didn't want to leap back into this uh, non-existent thing called the mainstream. And, uh, and it was only the book. And I think, and, and I sat there for a couple of, uh, about a year and a half, hoping to finish it. And so the relationship was that I couldn't finish it until I resolved a few things. I mean, I, I couldn't, I certainly despise just putting down exposition, telling the details, and on October 4th I did this, and then that happened. I can't, I can't stand doing that. I can't sit down and do that. There are writers who can do that, reporters, for instance, who do that very well. I, I, I'd rather have my teeth grinded uh, uh, than do that. So I, I had to find reasons to, to, I had to find a way to write it and reasons to write it that were interesting to me and hopefully worth your time. Because it never occurred to me that anybody walking p past a bookstore would be particularly interested in uh, what this person, unknown person named Lee Stringer had to say. And that if I was lucky enough for somebody to happen to pick up a book and browse through it, I wanted to make sure that, that you know, they, they felt they'd done a good thing and, and, and might even want to continue. But uh, so, so in, in, out of that process, I found that um, I couldn't find a way into any, any of the episodes in the book until I had gotten a hold of it a little bit, till I understood what it meant to me and not only what the people around me were doing, but, you know, why, maybe? So, so there's a, by the end of writing this book, I had answered a whole bunch of questions. And I thought that was, that was a very wonderful thing. It was almost, having it published, uh, uh, Dan, it was, it was almost an afterthought uh, in that respect. Because uh, for me, the top of the mountain was getting to the end, of, uh, answering those questions for myself. All right, well, let's uh, cause some more trouble with the final selection. This is from Timequake. A Luddite to the end, as was Kilgore Trout, as was Ned Ludd, the possibly but not certainly fictitious workman who smashed up machinery supposedly in Leicestershire, England at the beginning of the 19th century, I persist in pecking away at a manual typewriter. That still leaves me technologically several generations ahead of William Styron and Stephen King, who, like Trout, write with pens on yellow legal pads. I correct my pages with pen or pencil. I've come into Manhattan on business. I telephone a woman who's been doing my retyping for years and years now. She doesn't have a computer either. And maybe I should can her. 
She's moved from the city to a country town. I ask her what the weather is like out that way. I ask if there have been any unusual birds at her bird feeder. I ask if squirrels have found a way to get in and so on. Yes, the squirrels have found a new way to get to the feeder. They can become trapeze artists if they have to. She's had back trouble in the past. I ask how her back is. She says her back is okay. She asks how my daughter Lily is. I say Lily is okay. She asks how old Lily is now, and I say she'll be 14 in December. She says, 14. My gosh, my gosh, it seems like only yesterday she was just a little baby. I say I have a few more pages for her to type, and she says, good. I will have to mail them to her since she doesn't have a fax. Again, maybe, maybe I should can her. <laughs> I'm still on the third floor of our brownstone in the city, and we don't have an elevator, so down the stairs I go with my pages. Clumpity, clumpity, clumpity. I get down to the first floor where my wife has her office. My her favorite reading when she was Lily's age was stories about Nancy Drew, the girl detective. Nancy Drew is to Jill what Kilgore Trout is to me. So Jill says, where are you going? I say, I am going to buy an envelope. She says, you are not a poor man. Why don't you buy a thousand envelopes and put them in a closet? <laughs> she thinks she's being logical. She has a computer. She has a fax. She has an answering machine on her telephone, so she doesn't miss any important messages. She has a Xerox. She has all that garbage. I say, I'll be back real soon. Out into the world I go. Muggers, autograph hounds, junkies, people with real jobs. <laughs> Maybe an easy lay. United Nations functionaries and diplomats. Into the news store I go. Relatively poor people with lives not strikingly worth living are lined up to buy lottery tickets or other crap. <laughs> All keep their cool. They pretend they don't know I'm a celebrity. <laughs> the store is a ma and pa joint owned by Hindus, honest to God Hindus. The woman has a teeny weeny ruby between her eyes. That's worth a trip. I mean, who needs an envelope? <laughs> you must remember this, a kiss is still a kiss, a sigh is still a sigh. Now I know the Hindu stock of stationery as well as they do. I didn't study anthropology for nothing. <laughs> I find one 9 by 12 manila envelope without assistance, remembering simultaneously a joke about the Chicago Cubs baseball team. The Cubs were supposedly moving down to the Philippine Islands where they would be renamed the Manila Folders. <laughs> be a good joke about the Boston Red Sox, too. I take my place at the end of the line, chatting with fellow customers who are buying something other than lottery tickets. The lottery ticket suckers, decorticated by hope and numerology, may as well be victims of post-timequake apathy. You could run them over with an 18-wheeler. They wouldn't care. From the news store, I go one block south to the postal convenience station, where I am secretly in love with a woman behind the counter. I've already put my pages in the manila envelope, I address it, and then I take my place at the end of another long line. What I need now is postage, yum, yum, yum. The woman I love, who is there, does not know that I love her. You wanna talk about poker faces. When her eyes meet mine, she might as well be looking at a cantaloupe. I put the waiting time to good use. I learn about stupid bosses and jobs I'll never have, about parts of the world I will never see, about diseases I hope I'll never have, about different kinds of dogs people have owned, and so on. By means of a computer? No. I do it by means of the lost art of conversation. I at last have my envelope weighed and stamped by the only woman in the whole world who could make me sincerely happy. With her, I wouldn't have to fake it. I go home. I have had one heck of a good time. Listen, we are here on Earth to fart around. <laughs> Don't let anybody tell you any different. <laughs> Amen. Which leads to the last question, which is, do you agree that there is a place beyond the text that readers are experiencing when they read you? And if so, what is the place beyond the words that you write? Well, as, as I've said, uh, 
our audience has to be performers, and so they have brought themselves, they have done work in order to decode these messages on the page, and uh, so they, because they are involved, they become our partners, they've brought themselves to it. That's the extra dimension about which we know nothing, but it's delightful to know uh, that they can bring them to it. They have to, or they can't read. Um, I don't know. I don't know how, quite how I could say. I can tell it in a story, maybe, um, because the, the, I, I sense there's a, another dimension, but I can't quite nail it down. But I can tell this story, which may get near there. It was during, while I was on the street one day, I was walking down 42nd Street between 8th and 9th Avenue. It's the middle of the afternoon. It's a, it was kind of a gray day. And uh, what, we, what I had coming towards me was sort of a marching army. People just slogging along in the middle of the day. Nobody was smiling. Everybody was walking, going to wherever they were going or coming from wherever they'd been. And, and, and if you really looked at it, they were all suffering in a sense. They were all, it was just a burden to, to go through what was their day. And as I got near the end of the corner, I hear the tinkle of a piano, and I see above the heads, all these gray heads, this one pink sort of melon-shaped thing going like this, like this. And I got nearer and nearer the corner, and I found out it was a preacher from Jersey. He'd set up these huge speakers on the end of 42nd Street, which I call God's Corner. Uh, and he was playing this very bright, very modern gospel music in the middle of this very gray, very sad kind of day. And he was just keep leaping up and down with joy. And just and no reason for it. He just set up these speakers and he was dancing in the streets and he was smiling and he was bouncing around and people were walking by. And as I came abreast of him, the, the sun broke through the clouds. It was almost prophetic. And a light burst on it, and it's turning his pink face iridescent. And I said to myself, God, no, that's where I want to be, where this guy is. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, that's the kind of dimension I'd like to, I can't, I, I'd like to be less direct, but more just people to just sort of read and say, well, you know, that's where I'd like to be. As simple as that. Thank you. I, ju I just want to add that virtually every writer I know would rather be a musician. Why? <laughs> <laughs> because uh, music gives pleasure as we never can. This is, uh, music is the most pleasurable and magical thing we can experience mm. and uh, I'm <clears throat> I'm honorary president of the American Humanist Association but I simultaneously say that music is the proof of the existence of God mm. Mm. you play an instrument by the way I play a clarinet badly and I really had no gift mm. for it whatsoever <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you uh, our president is no bad mean reed man. He's, he's, he's not bad. I've heard him play. And, uh, that nobody has brought that in his defense. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that man can really blow, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. What do you think is the relationship, say, between the Kurt Vonnegut and the Lee Stringer is sitting here and the one that the reader encounters in a book? Wow, that's a tough question. I don't know. Well, you go first on this one. Well, I, 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 I would... One nice thing about our trade is compared with poetry or with painting, uh, and possibly with music, is we don't envy each other. Is Whistler, James McNeil Whistler, uh, the painter, said if you wish to see envy go among the painters. Uh, but novelists do not envy each other, and uh, if, if a writer succeeds, uh, makes a lot of money, that makes all other writers 
happy. Uh, and so it's a most agreeable field we're in, and I think, in a sense, uh, we are veterans of the same battle, and we know what the hell it was like. It's, it's, you know, we're not like Duke Wayne, who was never in a battle. Uh, but we know what that fight is like, and, and we respect each other for making it. And anyone who has finished a book, whether the thing has been published or not, whether the thing is any good or not, is a colleague of ours. Um, for me, um, I, re I read uh, Kurt's books when I, uh, years ago. Um, I, I read them just, uh, I never wanted to be trendy, so I read them just after everybody else read them. And uh, then I was sorry I had waited so long. Uh, but um, when uh, I heard that Kurt liked my book, my, it, was, it was like meeting a comrade. I mean, it was, it was uh, to have another writer um, speak favorably about your work is just a great feeling because it is kind of a, it's not a science. We're not making porcelain. We're not, you know, cutting out sorb two by fours. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy stuff to just sit in a room and click away at a, well, in my case, uh, if you'll forgive me, a, a Mac. Uh, for, uh, you know, for eight or nine hours is a very unnatural thing to do. And it's, it, there's no one there to tell you whether you, what you're doing right or wrong. You just sort of got to, it's a very scary thing for me. I mean, to spend a year or so doing that. And, and, and the real fear, fear is that you'll look, look back and say, gee, I wasted a year doing nothing. So in, in the midst of that loneliness, to have uh, another writer say, well, you know, eh, you did all right. Is, is a great thing, and, and uh, in that respect, I feel like Kurt's a comrade for life. And, and, and then, have, and then reading, rereading some of his stuff and reading uh, re some of his interviews and, and hearing his comments, it wasn't just a, it, it, we, it, I, thought, I thought we were real comrades because there is something that a lot of writers I've read about who've talked about writing, uh, especially uh, modern day writers such as Kurt and and James Baldwin is a, someone I've read, and Ralph Ellison and uh, and um, Nelson Algren is is there is something we all do that's similar. We we sort of futz about saying what that is, but it I you know I can I can hear it resonating in in, in the words of all these people. So so that's about as <laughs> I sort of overwork overworked that little thought. But thank you for listening. <laughs> I always liked Jacqueline Suzanne, who was, I considered her a colleague, and, and critics wouldn't like me, a person as pretentious as myself, to, to like Jacqueline Suzanne. But I did like her very much, and uh, she wrote with utter sincerity, or people would not have bought these books, is mm. you cannot fool a reading audience. And she was sincere with all her storytelling, and. A very nice thing happened between Jacqueline, Suzanne, and myself before we met. Valley of the Dolls, I think it was, was number one on the bestseller list for, I don't know, two years, something like that. Entertained a lot of people. And I finally knocked her off with Breakfast at Champions, which was very briefly number one on the bestseller list. And I got a note from this woman who was a stranger at that time. She said, as long as it had to be someone, I'm glad it was you. Isn't that graceful? You spoke of uh, Lee before as a born writer. Do you feel that you were a born writer as well? I, I don't know. Yes, I think so, because... Uh, some people are born musicians, some people are born chess players or whatever, and uh, in school, I, I could, some people could run a lot faster than I could, I could write better than most people could. Uh, so yes, I got lucky. I, uh, Joe Heller and I recently confessed something, which is shameful for two writers to confess to each other. We had both had relatively happy childhoods, which is... <laughs> <laughs> Which is no way for a writer to begin. Uh, <laughs> what about yours, Lee? It's none of my business. Um, you know, it was happy to me. 
Yeah. It was happy to me. I, I was I was angry, but I was happy at the same time. I don't know if you can understand that. Um, I wasn't satisfied. Maybe that that has an impact. Mm -hmm. But you know, I tried to write when I was uh, younger a few times, but it it was never about anything. I mean, I, I liked to play with words. I certainly liked to read a lot. Um, but it was never about anything that I knew anything about. It was always about, you know, uh, spies and, and plant and trips to outer space and, and things I didn't know anything about. And it had nothing to do with any characters. So I, I get about, you know, I get a great first paragraph. And then I have a, a trunk full of first paragraphs somewhere that uh, may, might, might become a book one day if I, if I get lucky. You want some tips on writing? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, you know, for me, I like to, I have fun discovering, I have a lot of fun bumping into discover. It's, it's, a, it's a joy of discovery for me. I, I kind of would not like to know what I'm doing. I, I had a lot of fun trying to, to figure out how I, I'm going to fill up these pages and then convinced that I was I'm not, and then bingo, something happened. It, it, it is, it's like, shake, it's, it's like shaking hands with God for a second. It's really a great, great payoff for the hours you sit around wondering if you can do what you're trying to do. Once again, a proof of God, I think. Uh, sculptors, of course, feel that somebody else is using their hands. Wow that they couldn't possibly be doing this. Anyway, the arts are so good to those who practice them. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, if did you ever get, now that I have you here, uh, and we, I, I wanted to talk to you in private, but that hasn't happened yet, but there's one question I wanted to ask you. <laughs> what, we, is, do you. Do you find you get to a point when you're writing when it's, it's almost like taking dictation? Uh, well, I'll have to think about that. Uh, yeah, in a way, as I, I had never thought about that uh, image before. Yes, I guess so. Is uh, I, I feel I'm lucky as hell. As again, I can't really do this. Uh, somebody else must be doing this, like taking dictation. But again, uh, I've written a hell of a lot of crap. As it had been published most of it, but I would come to work and uh, write all day or write for three, four hours. And this is lousy. Have you done that? Absolutely. <laughs> there's, there's two other Grand Central Winters in the drawer. <laughs> well, that may be a good place to end. <laughs> I think. Kurt Vonnegut, Lee Stringer, thank you very much for coming. The uh, book is Grand Central Winter by Lee Stringer. And... Thank you.